Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Now, prophecy number 35 has been fulfilled, and that is that men will store up wealth. You think, well, what's wrong with that? Let's turn to James 5 and see what it says about wealth in the last days. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy, is there? Or is there? There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's not money. It's what you do with it. It's your attitude towards it. But when it comes to money in the last days, there's a very interesting passage in James 5 that says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Now, that's just interesting to me because I think that sounds like what we would feel like if the market crashed and we lost everything. Come now, you rich, because we are rich. The poorest of us in the United States are richer than 95% of the world. Come now, you rich, weep and howl at your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. When that happens, that's when we weep and howl. And that's what would happen. Verse 3. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and the rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is when? In the last days that you have stored up your treasure. See, that's what, in the last days we've stored up our treasure, so that treasure, our money, has become our focus. Do you know what we're supposed to do with our money? Do you know what God tells us to do with our money? Why he gave it, gives us money? If you, it, to what? That's it. Let's turn to Ephesians. I'll read you the passage here in Ephesians 4. He says in verse 28, Let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his hands for what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has meat. So it doesn't mean we can't have nice things. But it means we're supposed to use the money God has give, given us to take care of our needs and the needs of others. This tells us in James 5 that in the last days, before Jesus returns, we're going to be storing up our money. Would you say that's true? Well, let's look at the statistics. In 1900, there was $2 trillion of world wealth. Today, there's $250 trillion. Well, that's in, just in the 30 largest countries, by the way. Of course, that's where most of the wealth is. 10% of the population holds 86% of all wealth. What does that tell you? For the most part, they're not sharing it. They're not taking care of others. The U.S. debt, when I looked at it a couple days ago, is $18,787,000,000,000. That equals $58,284 debt ratio for every person in the United States. For everybody who pays taxes, that equals $157,182 in debt ratio. Here's an interesting thing. $10 trillion is owned by individuals, investors, corporations, states, and local governments of our 18, almost $19 trillion in debt. But 46% of our debt is owned by foreign countries. Now, I was watching Secretary of State the other night. I don't know how many of you watched that. But I think it's a good show. We were watching it, and the Secretary of State had called in the Chinese ambassador. Did you see that? You know, questioning him as something he'd done. And he basically said to her at the end, Madam Secretary, if we wanted to, to destroy the United States, we just sit back and wait, wait a while, and then we're going to foreclose on you. <laughs> that makes perfect sense because 46% of our debt is owned by foreign countries. They're going to take us over from our debt. The point being is there is more wealth in the world than ever before. And that wealth is being stored up by the people who have it. Jesus said that would happen. Now, you know, I'm saying looking around this room, my guess is that all, 100% of you, if not 99.8% of you, have a 401k or a savings account. That's storing up your wealth. Now, does that mean don't save your money? No, we have to be smart. We have to be responsible. But are we storing up our money because we're focused on riches? Are we going to weep and howl when it's taken away when the stock market crashes? You know, trillions of dollars goes away like that every time the stock market goes down. Is our, the, to me, this passage says that in the last days we're going to be so focused on our money 
And we're going to have so much wealth in the world that when it's taken away, we're going to be miserable because that's where our focus is. Is that where our world is today? It really is. I mean, hey, I'm guilty of it sometimes. I worry about the future and money and things that are going to happen, and I've got some money in the bank. We get so concerned about having enough money because what if, and being responsible. I have a, I know someone who passed away recently who just had millions and millions of dollars. And the person was a, a great philanthropist in their heart. And they didn't give away one cent at their death. Now everybody does something, everybody does different things. But if you really wanted to help other people, wouldn't you give at least 5% of your money away to the people you care, things you cared about besides your family? When you have that kind of wealth. Now if you just have a little bit, you want to take care of your family. It's just interesting the wealth that we've stored up and what we're doing with it. That's a fulfilled prophecy, folks. We're here. Now, it could get better. I mean, we could continue to store up our wealth, or worse, depending on how you look at that. But we have reached a point that no other generation has ever seen as to storing up our wealth. And we're so wrapped up in it that we will be miserable when it's crafted, if it does. Prophecy number 36 fulfilled. Pestilence will become epidemic. Well, I don't even need to go through those, but I, I think you know. I, I think that probably the most interesting statistic here is that there are 335 new diseases that have been identified since 1940. Now clearly that's with advances in science and technology. I was also surprised to read that one in four of the deaths in the United States are from cancer. That's a pestilence. We have AIDS. That's a new disease. They're controlling it, but it's still there. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to the hospital because a lot of people get sicker in the hospital than they do before they go. You have superbugs in the hospital. You have MRSA. You have staph infections. And a lot of, it just, that's where sick people are. The bugs are resilient now to antibiotics. So you have a lot more diseases that are propping up, especially in hospitals. You have the flus, the swine flu, the bird flu, the Asian flu, and all of that's mutating. It amazes me every year when they said, get the flu shot. And then after you get it, they say, well, we calculated wrong. The whole different strains are coming out. Now you either got to get another one or, or sorry, you missed it. We don't know because so many new strains are coming out. The Ebola scare that we've had in the world and in the United States in the last year, that could creep up again. AIDS, as I mentioned. MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. That's been an epidemic in the Middle East. You don't hear much about it because it hasn't affected us so much. But with world travel, all of these things could happen to us. All you need is one sick person on an airplane, and all of us could get it. You've heard about the new epidemic of measles in the school, how they're trying to force the kids now, all of the kids, to have shots so that they don't bring these into the schools. Well, why are they forcing our kids to have certain shots when they're not forcing the kids who come in from other countries to have those shots? Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions there. But we're seeing the rise again of old diseases that we thought were defunct. I've heard too that there's a, a small outbreak of tuberculosis that's going around in different places. Um, you have the, well that's American Cancer Society, I already gave you that. A third of Americans have sexually transmitted diseases and in a matter of a few years it's going to be half. A number of outbreaks, a number of kinds of diseases have both increased significantly since 1980 according to the Journal of the Royal Society Interface in an article in 2014. So we consistently are having all these new outbreaks of diseases. Pestilence is increasing. Let me read you that passage in Matthew 24 where it says it. You have to have the King James Version because it's not in the New American Standard. But what it says in Jesus' words about the last days, he says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there would be famines and pestilence in the King James and earthquakes. Famines, pestilence, earthquakes. Um, I didn't even put famines on here. I probably need to add that as number 41. But statistically speaking, with famines, a third of the world is fed, a third of the world is underfed, and a third of the world is starving. That's statistically the way it is today. You have, I forget the number, but something like a million people a day dying of starvation around the world because it's become such a problem. 
Now we are well fed, the Western nations are well fed. The interesting, sad part is that the Western nations are trying to help the third world countries. What's happening, however, is the politicians are keeping the money, or they're keeping the supplies, or they're using it to trade for arms, and the people aren't getting it, and they're dying. So famine's increasing significantly. Then you have earthquakes. That's just, from, again, from that passage from Matthew 24, 7. And that is that earthquakes are going to intensify. Well, you've always had earthquakes. And people will say that earthquakes have intensified because we have a better geological system in the Richter scale. Well, <laughs> that could be true because the Richter scale was developed in 1935. But they, they have these measurements that they can go back on these old earthquakes and they can measure them according to their new measurements. Uh, the National Earthquake Institute of something uh, says that there's 20,000 earthquakes per year, about 55 a day. If you live in California, or at least the paper that I see when I go to Palm Springs, always has a list on the back that tells you how many earthquakes there were the day before. And there's always dozens and dozens. But they're so small, nobody feels them. So it's not unusual to have that many. There's 15 major earthquakes per year at 7.0 and above. From 1973 to 2001, the average, however, exceeded that average number of earthquakes by 21%. So we seem to be growing in numbers of earthquakes that we're having. From 1900 to 2000, the world averaged seven earthquakes per decade at 8.0 or above. Just in the last decade, pretty much, we've had 17. So clearly, we've gone from an average of seven a decade to 17. That's an increase. Of 10 most powerful earthquakes recorded in history, six of them have been from 1952, basically our generation, with two of them just in the last decade alone. Again, earthquakes are intensifying. Uh, in Israel, there's a major quake every 80 years, but there hasn't been one since 1927, so they're due for another one. Earthquake, 6.5 in magnitude or better. Between, uh, excuse me, that should say between 1900 and 1969, they averaged six per decade. From 1970 to 1989, they were 10 per decade. They've increased from the early January of 90 to July of 90 to 200 per decade. And then from August of 90 to October of 92, they increased to an average of 600 per decade. That tells us that earthquakes are increasing and they're increasing in intensity. Now there's a big discussion about fracking in our country. And that is dealing with the oil, taking out the oil, and the fracking is causing more earthquakes. Because <coughs> there's a lot of earthquakes that are taking place in Oklahoma and Texas where they're doing a lot of this fracking. It could be. Maybe that's why the intensity is, is happening because of the oil they're taking out of Middle Eastern countries too doesn't matter. All that matters is they intensify. Jesus didn't say they're going to intensify for a particular reason. He just said they intensify. As you read the book of Revelation, you see that major earthquakes happen consistently in the book of Revelation. So maybe the taking out of oil is going to start more and more earthquakes. We don't know. We do know, however, that we're seeing this fulfilled. It's going to continue to intensify, but we're seeing it fulfilled today. Number 38, uh, <coughs> men will become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of, and lovers of self. What it says at the beginning is lawlessness increases. Men become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of self. Now we've already talked about that a little bit, but what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12 is lawlessness will increase and most people's love will grow cold. Again, we're seeing that. Very similar to the apostasy we discussed. Some of the examples are t Islamic terrorism. There's been brutality, whether it be from Babylon, whether it be from the uh, Ottoman Turks. Down through the centuries, there's always been barbarism. But right now, we're seeing it in spades. Islamic terrorism, ISIS. You'd, in the past, you knew who your enemy was. Today, we don't know who our enemy is. I mean, we don't know that somebody walking in and sitting down as part of this group is an, is an Islamic terrorist. I mean, we don't know. We can't identify them. They don't wear uniforms. They don't have a sign around their neck. It used to be you could tell the enemy. You can't tell them anymore. So lawlessness is increasing. You have the Sunni versus the Shia Islamic infighting all over the Middle East. That's increasing. You have Arabs 
all the 22 Arab League nations are teaching their kids to hate the Jews and kill them. Obviously, that's lawlessness increasing. You have children killing children in our country, thinking it's a lark. I read a story of a, of a young gal who was raped and beaten and murdered and left out in a field. You know what happened? Kids went out to see her. They would go over and walk by to see her because they were interested before anybody ever turned in that she was there. I'm sorry, but that's a little distorted. Cape Town, South Africa. Serious crime every 17 seconds. The United States, we have the Occupy movement, which became a, a sit-in kind of a thing, but it was a very disruptive, di divisive movement. Of course, in the Middle East, we had the Arab Spring, and the Occupy movement was an outgrowth of that. Now we're having the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, I'm sorry, but Black Lives Matter and White Lives Matter and every life matters. You don't take preference over one person or another. That's discrimination, and we're told we can't discriminate. It's causing divisiveness. It's lawlessness. It's causing lawlessness like what we saw in Ferguson. That was ridiculous the way they burned down the places and absolutely went without any rhyme or reason into the lawlessness they had. Scandalous behavior by role models. You got the political leaders. <clears throat> I did not have sex with that woman. Uh, you have the businesses, Enron. You have people embezzling so they could go play, the, go play at the boats across the way. You have corporate executives lying and cheating. You have movie stars and athletes that are, I mean, these are our role models and what kind of a role are they modeling? Yeah. He's suing the women? Yeah. No. Yeah. And now she said you have Bill Cosby suing the women. Okay, uh, anyway. 3.4% of annual increase in female prison population. The women are doing it more and more now. They're the largest increase in, in population in our prisons. You have one in 35 U.S. adults that are somehow in the penal system. They're either on parole, on probation, or they're in the jails or the prisons. One in 35 of us. The U.S. Penal Code, when it was changed in 1962, started all of this because it took out a lot of what was legal or what was illegal and made it legal. And then you have abortion, which became legal in 1973. That allowed for the killing of unborn children, which then says that life only matters if it's important to us or if it has value to us. That's a whole mindset. Uh, there's 512,000 annual federal tort lawsuits. Tort lawsuit is I'm suing you because you did something wrong to me. 512 federal, that's not local. Lawlessness is increasing. We're seeing it, it's here today. Now, is that fulfilled? Are some of these fulfilled? They are fulfilled, but they can continue to be fulfilled. They can continue to get worse. The point being is we're seeing an increase in all of these things. That means something's happening. And not only is it an increase, it's exponentially an increase. Consistently in pestilence, in famine, in earthquakes, in lovers of pleasure, in acts of lawlessness. Prophecy number 39, dreams and visions will become prominent. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. This is a quote out of Joel chapter 2 in the Old Testament. It's uh, actually an exact quote, Joel 2, 28 to 32, but I'm going to read it to you out of the New. It says, There shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now Peter gave that prophecy at the time of the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. So he was saying visions and dreams were starting then. But he's also using this as a time of the end times, as a dual prophecy, as a sign of the end times. What are we seeing today in visions and dreams? Well, first of all, you have to be very careful because... You know, smoke a little marijuana and you'll have visions and dreams. You have to know that these are from God. I read a couple, some books that are really good. You look at Joe Rosenberg's book called Revolution. You look at Tom Doyle's book, uh, Dreams and Visions, or his other book, Killing Christians. And then uh, A Wind in the House of Islam. I can't remember the author on that. All of them give testimonies of what's going on in the Muslim world to those people who are having visions of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, we have to be careful because visions must match up with the Bible. 
what's happening a lot of time in these visions is people are seeing Jesus and Jesus is saying things to them. Most of the time, I think in every one that I've read, but don't quote me on that, when this happens, what that does is it gives them a desire for Jesus. Then they meet other people who are Christians and they go, start going to church and they find out about who Christ is in the Bible. So it's not that they all get saved at that moment, but Jesus speaks to them and he changes their lives. A couple of examples. Uh, this one I love. It's out of Joe Rosenberg's book, Revolution, I think. And uh, it's about a woman who is watching. She's from Iraq. And the Jesus film is piped into her TV. So here she is, a Muslim woman. She's watching the Jesus film on her TV. At the end of it, they quote Romans, uh, Revelation 3.20. And it says, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I will come in to you and I will dine with you and you with me. Okay? So she's watching that and goes, wow. All of a sudden she hears a knock on the door. And she goes and she opens the door and it's Jesus. And she lets him in and he comes in and he talks to her. And then he leaves. And so she calls up these people at the end and says, call us if you have questions. She said, I just knocked, or Jesus just knocked on the door. And I let him in. And they said, oh, that's great. That's what the Bible verse says. You're supposed to let him into the door of your heart and this and that. She said, no, no, no. You don't understand. He was at my door. And he came right into my apartment. And then she, prayed, she accepted him as her Lord and Savior. I mean, that's pretty spectacular. There's a Muslim woman who doesn't know anything about Jesus. And he knocks. She, because she sees it literally. And it was a vision. A vision is when it happens when you're awake. A dream is when it happens when you're asleep. Then the stories of uh, people, Layla, a gal I used, I've used before as an example. She was from Syria. This is in the book, uh, Killing Christians. She lived in Syria. She had a husband who beat her so radically that he broke her jaw one night, and then he took a rod and he jammed it through her eardrum. She was so miserable, she kept praying to God, Allah, help me, help me, help me. Finally one night she said, wait a minute, maybe I'm praying the wrong thing. Maybe I ought to say, who are you, God? I want to know you, and I need your help. That night, Jesus appeared to her in a dream. Well, she was so taken aback, she told her neighbor, her Muslim neighbor, which she just don't do. But she, she finally told her about all the abuse that was going on, and she told her Muslim neighbor. Well, it turns out her Muslim neighbor had converted to Christianity. And they took her to church, and she became saved. But that didn't stop the beatings. Her husband continued to beat her. One night, Jesus woke her up. Well, one night, her husband confronted her about her late night goings out because they have to go to church at 1 o'clock in the morning. So she had to sneak out to do that, and he found out. And he confronted her, and she thought she was dead. But he was very calm, and that scared him more than anything. Jesus woke her up in the middle of the night, and he said, take your son and leave right now and go to Jordan. I have people waiting there for you. She got up. She scrounged for every penny she could get or whatever they're called over in Syria, she walked out the door in the middle of the night in war-torn Syria, and there's a cab right there at the end of the street. She says, will you take me to, to Jordan? And he said, how much money do you have? Or she said, how much would it cost? And it cost the exact amount as she had with her. And he took her to Jordan, just like Jesus told him. These are story after story. You have millions of people, six million Muslims, who have converted just in this century alone, in the last 15 years that we know about. Many, well, it says here, according to the report, 42% of the new believers in Africa have come to Christ through visions and dreams. So when somebody says to you, well, how can Jesus share the gospel? How can the gospel be shared in Africa? You don't need to. Jesus can appear to them and show them in dreams and visions. That's what we're seeing in the last days, just as the prophecy said would happen. Will this continue? I sure hope so. Because it's pretty exciting. Are we seeing it in America? I'm really not hearing the stories in America. Because we can go to church every day. We don't have the... The reason I believe they're converting to Jesus and seeing to Jesus, they're asking for who God really is over there. Because they don't understand why Muslims would fight Muslims if Allah was the true God. They're doubting, they're questioning, and they're open to finding the one true God. We have the one true God, and we take him for granted. We're not seeing the dreams and visions as far as I know around here. And by the way, it's not just Muslims. It's China and other places. But these are some of the spectacular ones that have been written about. And then prophecy number 40, near fulfillment. The gospel will be preached to the whole world 
and then the end will come. It's said that 99.5% of the world has already heard the gospel. And those who haven't, through missionaries and satellite and telephones and internet, those who don't have it, they can receive it through dreams, just like we saw. Or, according to Romans 1, they can find God just in nature. Because this Layla, she didn't call out to Jesus Christ and said, Jesus Christ, come help me. She cried out and said, who are you, God? I want to know you. And then God, it's God's responsibility to let us know Jesus after that. Now, here's some statistics that I found from the United Bible Societies. And that is that the Bible is available in 2,530 languages right now. And there's 2,195 languages in progress. Now, that's of the 6,500 known languages. So we're, we're talking about 4,600, 4,700 languages in the near future that the Bible will be translated into of the 6,500. And by the way, 2,000 of those languages have less than 1,000 adherents. So, I mean, if you just translate it into 4,500, you just keep, reach almost everybody on the earth. Um, now, that's interesting because I was given a sheet tonight of Wycliffe Bible Translators has some statistics that are different than this. They say that there are almost 7,000 languages known today and that there's more than 500 languages that have the complete translation of the Bible and more than 1,300 languages that now have the New Testament and portions of the Bible. So that would be a total of 1,800 languages and the United Bible Society says 2,530 that have it. Um, they also say here that there's more than 2,300 languages across the 131 countries that currently have active translation and linguistic development work in progress. So our numbers are just a little bit off. That's closer. This says 2195, this says 2300. Our numbers are closer. The point being is there's people out there trying to share the gospel. They have been since missionaries came, really came popular in the, in the 1700s. God is doing miraculous things to let people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ or to know it. But the fact is, it might not be us, up to us to fulfill that prophecy. It might be up to God. Because in Revelation chapter 14, it says, uh, verse 6, to, okay, Revelation 14, 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. That statement is in the middle of the tribulation period where God sends an angel to declare the gospel to everybody else that's left in the world. So perhaps that's what Jesus is talking about rather than the 99.5% who've already received the gospel. Either way, we are right there, folks. The gospel has or is being preached to almost everybody on the face of the earth. What does that tell you? Jesus is coming soon. All those prophecies being fulfilled, not one thing needs, yeah, let's praise the Lord that he's coming soon. Not one thing needs to happen for Jesus to come right now for the rapture of the church. Not one prophecy is left to be fulfilled. All the ones that we've talked about that are near fulfillment will be the, during the tribulation or afterwards. But we're right there. Our generation is here. We've seen these 40 prophecies happen. All but two of them have happened in the last 80 years, 70 years, and our generation has seen it. That means Jesus is coming soon, folks. Are you ready? That's the key to tonight. If Jesus came for the rapture of the church tonight, would you go be with him in heaven? Or would you be left here on the earth to go through that seven years of hell on earth before he returns? That's a question you have to ask yourself because your eternal life depends on it. Do you have a choice? Everybody has a choice. And that, yes, people will be given an opportunity to accept Christ, I believe, through at least the middle of the tribulation. At that point, everyone who's left, I believe, from the, my understanding of Scripture, their hearts will be so hardened that they will not turn to God. That's the way I understand it. But I may be wrong. I'm not sure. But people still have a choice. The problem is, Life's tough enough these days. I don't want to have to go through life through the tribulation, which is God's wrath. I want to make sure today, because you know what? I don't know that I'm going to not walk out there and slip down, fall down on this rain and break a hip and, and die in the hospital tomorrow. 
I don't know that that's going to happen or get killed in a car accident. I don't want my eternal destiny to be up to chance. I want to make a decision now to know that I am going to be with Jesus whether he comes now or months or years from now. Or whether I go to be with him before it's his time to come. How about you? Let's pray. Father, you have told us as clearly as you can that you are coming soon. You also tell us in your word that nobody knows the day or the hour. So we're not setting dates, God, because we don't know. What we know is the signs of the times, and that is that these 40 fulfilled or near fulfilled prophecies show us that we're living in a generation that has never seen prophecies fulfilled like this except your first coming. That means, by all practical purposes, that you're coming soon. The most important thing is that everybody who hears your message that we're talking about, that they know you as their Lord and Savior. It's our decisions. You give us a free will. We have to make the choice. You don't force yourself on anyone, but you do reach out your arm in love to us, and you try and bring us to yourself. But we have to make the decision. Are we willing to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord, as God, as the Savior of our sins, as, as the one who died on the cross for us and rose from the dead to conquer death? Are we willing to submit to following Jesus Christ wherever he leads us? Are we willing to make him Lord of our lives? That's the key. If we're willing to do that and tell him that very thing, then we will be saved. We will have an eternal relationship with you. So if there's anyone here tonight that has never made that decision, God, I pray you impress it upon their hearts that they need Jesus right now. Not waiting because we don't know what the future holds, but right now. But again, you're not going to force yourself on anyone. So let your Holy Spirit guide them and prepare their hearts as you, as you do these people all over the world that are seeing you in dreams and visions. Let them see Jesus. And pray to receive Jesus Christ by those humble words. I believe, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus is God, died for my sins. And I confess Jesus as Lord right now. So that I can spend eternity with Him. For those of us who've made that decision, I pray that our lives will be changed knowing that Jesus is coming soon. That we will not walk out of here without direction from you. As a matter of fact, we ask your Holy Spirit to really push on our hearts to give us that passion for sharing the gospel with other people, for building relationships with people, for being Christ, for looking at Christ-centered things through Christ's eyes and people through Christ's eyes instead of being so caught up in the world or the money or the problems or the materialism. But instead, let us be caught up in Jesus Christ. Let us have the joy of our salvation through Jesus that we share with others. Father, we commit this to you, everything we've learned, and we pray that you will change us and glorify us and use us through it all. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. And everyone said, Amen. All right. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.